Good morning, everyone. Um, just thank you, Dr. Bell. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am delivering this talk on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So yes, it, this is my first day teaching by Zoom. I am uh, sorry that I can't be there in person, as was the case with Brian. Teaching last year was one of my favorite days last year, and I got to spend a lot of time talking to the last cohort about what happens when you build a bin that has emotional capacity and how it feels about being filled up and emptied and the kind of responsibilities that puts to you as the designers of those systems. This year I was going to talk about quantifying health because I've gotten very healthy and I have devices to do it and talking about that data and what that data means for us as a person, individual, well, that is not gonna happen this year. However, I had a moment of clarity, as one does every once in a while, and I realized that what I do as a futurist, because people ask me all the time, what does a futurist actually do? I figured out what I actually do is I help people understand time that this is the thing that I try to do. So we could say, oh, I can tell you what it's gonna be like in a year or three years or five years. I can't really, but I can help you sort of plan for a soft landing in those environments. But in fact, I've realized what I really do is help people get their heads around the time scale they're trying to operate in so that they can make reasonable decisions on that time scale. And it turns out that's not just a good idea for an individual or a business. That is now a good idea for absolutely everyone because we are now living in pandemic time. So that's where I'm gonna focus for about the next 30 minutes. Now, this is a hard topic because it is a now topic, because it is affecting all of us, because it's raw. This is a new topic to me. This is something that I haven't talked about. So all of this is new and it's raw and it's going to be imperfect and I ask for forgiveness at the beginning. But let's get started. So, there we are. All right, so on Sunday, I had a call with one of my oldest friends in the United States. And after the various pleasantries and how's it all going, he lives in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is one of the epicenters of the pandemic in America. And at a certain point, because he's been locked in his house for two months with his wife and his child, he melted down on me and he started confessing to me things that he hasn't been able to say to anyone else, certainly not anyone else in America, because he's come to this moment now where he's realized that all of the hopes that he had for his 16-year-old daughter are now completely reconfigured. And he's worried that when she figures out that her future is not going to be anything like she planned, she's going to lose the plot. She's re he's really worried about this. But really what I'm hearing is his own worry about his own fears as a parent, that as a person living through the pandemic, particularly living through the pandemic as he has in Massachusetts, that right now the future for him is completely unknown. And not only is it unknown, it's unknowable. And all of us as human beings, we actually need knowable futures. Because the knowable future is the yardstick by which we judge our sanity that we have this expectation that the next moment is going to be recognizably like the moment that came before it. Except that's not true right now, and we need to look at that now. We need to understand that now. So that's a bit of a precy. Let me sort of dive into what I really mean by this. There is an old concept in artificial intelligence, and by old, I mean 30 years old, because it's not really old. And it's a heresy in the field, in the same way that Catholicism has heresies, or Judaism has heresies, or pretty much any religion you want, AI has its set of heresies. And this is an old heresy in AI, and it hangs out in AI like a kind of bad smell. And it, it has its origins back in time. And the reason it's hung out is because it actually hinges on ideas of agency and ideas of autonomy and on the illusion of control. And it's this basic idea that we live and we're playing with fire and that things could run away. They could run away from us, that they could run in their own way, that they could be out of control, or rather, that they could be out of our 
control. And the way this manifests, at least in AI, well, that's how it looks, right? The whole idea of the Terminator, of Skynet suddenly achieving this machinic consciousness and then immediately launching the nuclear missiles and turning against its human creators and growing so fast, so big. Keep that in mind, so fast, so big, that it completely overwhelms us with its capacities. And that it does this so unstoppably, so comprehensively, that there's no way to react, and suddenly that changes everything. And does that sound weirdly familiar, folks? Because it's something that grows exponentially. It's something that overwhelms all human efforts to, to basically contain it. It overwhelms every possible system in such a way that it gives us no time to react, and it changes everything. Does that, does that sound familiar to any of you? Now, <laughs> it could very well, although I think in this case, that's a vaccine. Now, this imaginary hypothetical exponential growth process in the machinic realm has been termed singularity. Now, I do not like that word. There are some futurists who throw that word out at the drop of a hat. Dr. Bell and I are not those kinds of futurists. I find that word lazy. I find it sloppy. I find it imprecise. I find it a whole bunch of hand-waving and religious beliefs. But that said, I have now modified my position somewhat because I find that at certain times, its use is justified. And its use is justified if you are authentically in an exponential change process. So let me give you some other examples of exponential change processes. The most rapid exponential change process that we know of is criticality in a nuclear weapon, which happens on a time scale of, I don't know, nanoseconds to microseconds. And I noticed from one of your biographies that one of you is a nuclear engineer. Is that you? That's you, Jasmine? Okay, good. So fact check me if I get it wrong. But sir, criticality is nanoseconds to microseconds, right? Chemical reactions, such as explosions, time scale of microseconds to milliseconds. Earthquakes, which are also exponential releases of energy, time scale, seconds to minutes. And interestingly, something that Dr. Bell and I have a lot of experience with, Moore's Law, which was this idea that computing capacity would grow exponentially per unit time, that's taken decades, right? Moore's Law basically had a run from 1965 to around uh, 2015. So it had about a 50 year run of exponential growth every 18 months. And the fact that we're actually doing all of this right now, the way we are doing all of it everywhere is because of Moore's Law. So Moore's Law fundamentally transformed the world. But there are time scale differences here. And the time scale difference between a nuclear criticality and an earthquake, that's the same difference in time scale between an earthquake and Moore's Law. They're a billion times apart, billion times the time scale. So it tells you that exponential processes happen all the time, but on different time scales. Now, back in March, when things were really going off, and we will come back to that in a moment, my colleague Sally Dominguez pointed out something that I've been reflecting on ever since. And she was in lockdown first, because she's in the Bay Area. And as we headed into lockdown into Australia, she said, Mark, when things are proceeding exponentially, when exponential change is happening, the horizon that you're heading out on starts bending upward. And all of a sudden, the horizon that was giving you your forward view becomes the wall that you're ramming into at full speed. And that struck me because it was a really simple metaphor, really simple way of thinking of that exponential curve just going up. And I found in it a whole new way of understanding what a singularity actually is. It's not this sort of totalizing, brutal, machinic conquering. Rather, it has something to do with the nature of our experience of time. Because here's the thing, we have all just lived through a singularity. It's not something I thought was ever going to happen. But let me explain what I mean when I say we've all just lived through a singularity. So this is one of my favorite tweets that I saw. This was tweeted, if you want to take a quick look at that, that was tweeted at the end of March. All right, me at the beginning of March, me at the end of March, pretty much sums it up, right? And you'll see in the chat window, I dropped it in before you guys all popped on, there's, a, there's a, an article in Wired that I will reference in this part. Now, 
you need to draw the line somewhere about what singularity, when the singularity happened. And here's the thing, that line is not drawn at the same place for everyone everywhere. At the same time, the line's going to get drawn. Now, for the purposes of this talk, and probably for this day, although uh, this may bend a little bit, we're going to draw the line at 1.02 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time on the 12th of March 2020, which was when Donald Trump did his first primetime address from the Oval Office and produced a panic in America because he did it so weirdly and so poorly and... In Australia, we had already run out of toilet paper. And that became a signifier because it became a signifier for things getting very serious, even though we were all laughing about it. And when I mean that things got serious, I mean that time itself grew very dense with significant events. Now, we have this expectation, probably because we've just grown up in a world where significant events happen, on, if not at an at a equally spaced basis, they happen sort of at regular intervals, every so often. They could be spikes there and here and there. You can have a personal spike if you have a birth or a wedding or some other rite of passage, then your own time becomes very dense with events and it becomes quite memorable. And you're going to be designing your own rite of passage later on today, I know, because you're going to be designing a re-entry mechanism. Is that not true, Genevieve? It is. Well, Nations also have their own spikes of experienced time. Global polities can also have their experience. And they have that experience globally when some exponential growth process rises up and turns the horizon into the wall. And when we hit that wall at speed, effectively what we're doing is we're passing through something that I want to paraphrase, and this is just a placeholder phrase. I'm calling it dense time. And that's time with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of significant events in it, far more than normal, far more than a spike, something that is completely outside of our experience. Our experience of dense time is quite different from our experience of normal time because it seems as though everything slows down just as everything is speeding up. Or it just, it feels that way. And I know that's counterintuitive, but time is also the way that we read entropy. It's the way that we read change in the world. And when those changes happen really, really close together, we somehow still project that experience as being unchanging. And I know this makes no rational sense, but it's the way that we are sensing it. And this is so true of our lived experience of the pandemic that it almost doesn't bear pointing out that we actually just passed through this period of really dense time. And this dense time that we hit, that's the sign that we hit the rising horizon of this exponential growth process, that we literally plowed into it. And so the link that I sent you from Wired is an oral history of that same day in America, which was the 11th of March in America. And it's a whole bunch of points of view from a whole bunch of people who over a 15 to 20 minute period, because you sort of get the stuff following up to that, and then in a 15 to 20 minute period, in all of these different ways, all of these lives have been fundamentally transformed. And you can see people making decisions right before it changes, predicated on the fact that the next 15 minutes is gonna be pretty much like the 15 minutes that came before that, which is pretty much like the 15 minutes before that. And then all of a sudden, there's effectively a discontinuity, and all of a sudden, you aren't gonna make any clear bets about what the world's going to be like in 15 minutes. It's a when it changed moment. And it's when the USA encountered that wall of dense time and things started happening fast. And every single minute, something new happens, something unexpected, something unpredicted. And it's, it's this that gives you this dense time quality. Because what are we doing? We're constantly citing ourselves along the along the timeline, along our own personal horizons by the rate of change. And when the rate of change spikes upward, when it starts to grow exponentially, 
what happens is we lose our own ability to know that the next moment is going to be anything like the moment that came before it. And that's an unusual position. It's, it happens to individuals from time to time. It's really never happened to a whole planet from at any point in our history. And let's go to there. One of the qualities that we possess as a human being, and I should note that this is a quality pretty much of anything that learns. So all learning systems, whether they're cyber-physical systems, whether they're biological systems, whether they're human cultural systems, what we do is we try to predict future happenings based on our memories of past events. And if you go down the biological timeline all the way to single-celled life, you will find that there are forms of memory which involve taste and sensation and chemical gradients and forms of learning that basically grow out of this. So this is this idea that, that in fact, all of our biological cyber-physical systems are really geared around this ability to be able to predict future happenings based on past events. And with enough experience in a culture, in an individual, we gain a sense of accuracy about what we can expect to happen in a certain span of time. Now, that won't be accurate, it won't be perfect, but we can live with the level of inaccuracy around that. As time grows dense, that span gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And when exponential growth is at its greatest, that predictive ability that we all have, that we all grew up with, that's kind of basic to our biology and our cognition, it basically contracts to almost zero. You can think of this almost as if, if you know the theory of relativity, the relativistic contraction, the faster you go to the speed of light, the shorter everything gets, right? It just contracts and contracts and contracts. And you end up in the exponential, where you don't know what the future is going to bring, and you have no way to know what the future is going to bring. And that's essentially when someone's babbling about the singularity, whether it's a machinic singularity or not, that's really what it's all about. It's around that discontinuity, that you don't know what happens next. And what happens next? cannot be predicted reliably on the basis of past events. And so you get to that point in the U.S. around the 11th of March, you get to that point in Australia around the same time. It's gonna be, it's gonna be sloppy and it's gonna be different for different people in different parts of the culture. But it's not terribly different. And you get to this moment of maximum change when time becomes its most dense and the future becomes its most un knowable. And you can't see anything in front of you and you're effectively flying blind. And this is where survival instincts start to kick in because it's really all about surviving whatever span of time you can see, whatever span of time you're willing to make a prediction for. And at the peak of when things were changing, I believe that that span contracted to around 30 minutes. Things were changing so rapidly that people could not know whether the world 30 minutes from now would encompass the plans that they had made in this moment. And I call that span of time that you can have some sense of reliability about, I call it the forward planning horizon. How far out can you see and reliably predict into the future? And because of the incredible density of time, the incredible density of events, the forward planning horizon contracted to around 30 minutes here at its peak. And this is when people fled into lockdown because frankly, that was a survival instinct. It was simply the safest place to be. This is when people got into fights, panic buying toilet paper at the supermarket. Not because the toilet paper was a thing, but because people were displacing their own sense of uncertainty about what would happen next. And no one could say what would happen next. No one anywhere could say what would happen next. That's, 
I stop and think about that for a second, all right, because that's quite a thing. That has not ever happened in my lifetime, and it's not something I ever thought that I would see in my lifetime. And it's very peculiar and it's very disturbing for me as a futurist because my work is essentially focused on that forward planning horizon. And so when it disappears, I am acutely aware that something has gone wrong in the world. I can't tell you what, but I can tell you that something has gone wrong. And I was acutely aware of this contraction, but until I had my conversation with Sally, I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was. I was like, oh, we've hit the exponential wall. And it was beautiful because that gave me a metaphor, a model, to help to understand our own passage through dense time. And I remember through the end of March and early April, as the pandemic actually did grow quite rapidly around Australia, and none of us knew what would happen next. I remember going to bed every night and checking the news before I went to bed, and then waking up the next morning and waking up into a completely different world which, as I, again, I have to tell you, as a futurist, deeply disturbing. As a human being, deeply disturbing. As a futurist, you're like, wait, this is, this is, this is. And in seven or eight hours that I was getting sleep, the entire world had changed. All of the assumptions about how things had operated had changed. And this happened night after night after night. And then we adapted to lockdown, and we went and we hid in our homes, and we dreamed, we dreamt our very strange COVID dreams, which are a big thing around the world. And I have a feeling that one of the ways that we're processing this change in events. And as we started to flatten the curve here in Australia, things started to change because it went from not knowing what the next 30 minutes were going to be like to a reasonable expectation that you could plan for the next 30 hours. That in fact, it was possible to believe that tomorrow would be a lot like today. And we identified that in a very interesting way, which Genevieve also pointed to, which is that we started to feel like every day was the same. And the funny thing was we were kind of bored with that and at the same time we were holding that next to our hearts because it told us that we'd had some zone of predictability in our lives that we could actually repeat the same day with the same degree of predictability and that that would give us some zone of safety, some forward planning horizon. And some of that's because we were safe in our homes. Some of that's because we were growing more used to what had happened in our heads. And for our ability to plan forward, well, we could handle about a day. That was about good. And every day we prayed that the next day would look like the day before it. And in Australia, we've gotten enormously lucky because we did flatten the curve. We stopped the exponential growth. And so as the exponential curve starts to drop, you see more and more of the horizon in front of you. And so at the end of April, so a fortnight ago, right, for us here in Australia, we could start to see maybe 30 days into the future. We could actually start to get a sense of what May was going to be like, and we knew because National Cabinet met and they said, oh yeah, no, the kids will be going back to school, some things will be opening up. If things go well, there's always that provisional aspect. And we began to make the first steps toward exiting lockdown. Today's a big day in New South Wales because, my God, five adults can get together in a house. It's going to be amazing. And we'll come back to where we're headed in just a moment. But what I want to do is I actually want to take a look at what's behind us because we are exiting this incredible density of time. And we're beginning to feel as though we might be able to breathe again. But it's important for us to remember the nature of the experience that we have just passed through. Because it has taught us something viscerally. And part of what I'm trying to do in this talk is to take that viscerality and to give it language, to give it something that we can use in our cognition both as individuals and at the level of the whole culture. The culture is looking at lockdown as a thing that we can sort of pass through and get out the other side. It's not going to work that way. It's an event, and the event shapes everything that comes after it. We need to learn as much as we can from the experience that we have come through, that we're still passing through, although not at the same intensity, because we need to learn planning and skills and processes that are appropriate to the density of the time that we're operating in. And I want to point to something. 
we have had no experience of global dense time before this. This is a new thing. My gut is telling me it's not the last time. That in fact, over the course of your lives and your careers, for different reasons, in different ways, we will experience other forms of global dense time. And so the more we can learn from where we are right now, the better equipped we will all be to encounter those moments when they happen in the future. And it's different than our normal skills because the things that work well in a long time scale, when things aren't changing exponentially, are useless and possibly even dangerous when we're passing through dense time. And I know you want to think, well, we're done with dense time. I don't think dense time is done with us. And I feel as though that's one of the things we need to understand. Now, come back to the beginning here. Let me just get the last of those up. So, coming back to where I started, I was on the phone with a friend in America who had reached his limit because while Australia has managed to exit the acute phase of the pandemic or is exiting it, the same is not true in many other places in the world. It is certainly not true in the United States, even though they are very deep in denial about this. It's not true in many other places. And it means that the world that we're operating in at global scale, this week and for some time into the future to come, that world is operating on multiple time scales, multiple forward planning horizons. And in the United States, the pandemic is still radically foreshortening their forward planning horizon. And for a successful middle class person like my friend, like myself, he's never experienced this kind of absolute extended precarity. Certainly not for the months on end that it's become and with no real sense of what may come. And if you put a human being who's basically grown up in a broadly predictable environment into a situation where predictability and stability have been torn away, it's going to have huge consequences for them. And so we're now facing a new kind of question here. It's a, it's a, a question that we've never had to ask before, which is how do we engage with individuals? How do we engage with nations, with polities, with cultures that are operating on very different forward planning horizons? I did my very best to give my friend hope because what I did, I took a time up by the way, I took five minutes out, I was like, I'll call you back because he did melt down. So let's bring the temperature down, called him back. I said, let me tell you what life is like here because it is calmer here. And I said, you will be here. Yeah, I can't tell you exactly when, but you will be here. And the world that you fear, the world where nothing is true, you can't depend on anything. That world will fade and you will get more of a horizon. Now, at the same time that I was doing that to calm him, I also knew that I was sugarcoating the truth because the truth is none of us know what's going to happen as we exit lockdown. Is there going to be a second wave? Is there going to be a massive flare-up? Will we be able to control any of this? We could, in Australia, also end up back in an exponential growth phase. This is a giant experiment. No one knows how to do this. We are all learning it at the same time. And if that happens, then the horizon is going to rise up and we are going to smash headfirst into dense time again. And so there really is no looking behind us and going, well, that's done with. It doesn't work that way. Because that fact that we're done with that, that fact is not visible on our forward planning horizon. Even though that forward planning horizon is now probably extended out to about two months, if we make it through to the end of this month, we might have made it to a forward planning horizon that encompasses all the way to the end of this year. So it makes sense for us here today at the ANU, at the 3AI, and everywhere else that is transitioning from the acute phase of the pandemic to the chronic phase of the pandemic, to have a really good think about what can be most helpful to us and to other people if we head back into dense time and how we can talk to people who are having their own experience of it. Because we know now what we didn't before. We know now that this can happen. And because we know that, we can act from that knowledge. We can learn. We can reflect on our experience. And it's funny because uh, Genevieve and I are big friends of Stuart Brand, who many years or 
15 years ago started the Long Now Foundation. I think we need to start a Short Now Foundation, a counterpoint to that. And we need to think about this as how do we deal with this radically foreshortened now? We should tell Stuart that. <laughs> if we learn from our own experience, not only will it help us, the other key here is it will help us empathize with individuals like my friend who are still in very dense time. Empathy right now is probably our most important resource.